Today I'm driving in the Mercedes EQE and watching our video about the Mercedes EQE because, yeah, that's possible now. It's really interesting, uh, it's a uh, you know, very new feature here. You can watch YouTube online while driving as a passenger with these Bluetooth headphones here, also here Mercedes headphones. And it depends on where it is allowed. So for example, in the US, it depends really on the state. For example, in California, it's allowed, and when you cross the border, there needs to be like this geofencing that it then shuts down when you're in Nevada. Very interesting, definitely. But of course, I want to tell you more about today also how it is to drive in the Mercedes EQE. The first time in the EQE, the smaller EQS, so to speak. So far, we've driven the EQS. Now, the first ride along in the EQE. And we are joined here by the head of the EQE project, Jörg Miska. So thank you so Hi much there. for taking us on, on the ride. What was actually, um, you know, the goal? We know the EQS. Did you want to have the EQE like similar to the EQS? So you say like, oh, you drive like a smaller EQS version or something, or did you have like, oh, we want to make it completely different? Well, first of all, the, the EQ is a, is a family. It's a family of cars, and it's going to be it's going to be a full lineup of cars, limousines and SUVs. And uh, therefore, of course, there has to be some familiarity within that family for those cars, but also every product out of this family should have its individuality. And um, as said, the EQS is comparable to S-Class sedan and the EQE is more the, the new business limousine. And uh, it also has a lot of attributes that we kind of know from the CLS. So we, we like to compare it um, to the CLS as well as the E-Class itself. So it's more supposed to be an electric CLS than an electric E-Class? Well, I wouldn't go that far that uh, we would really differentiate those too much, but it's the, the limousine that you would use as a self-driver rather than the, the ultimate luxury limousine. And um, therefore we have positioned it more as a self-driving car so for the driver made for the driver but also with lots of room in the, in the second row as a business limousine yeah um, uh, oh yeah by the way the screen turns off when the driver is looking like five seconds mm -hmm. in that direction also for safety reasons um, also mm -hmm. very interesting feature so everything is said that the driver is not distracted by the screen there and yeah. But I mean, the driver has a lot, uh, a lot of traction here already, right? <laughs> <laughs> exactly, but um, let's say entertainment um, is not allowed while driving, and I think that's a, a very good ruling in this case. So uh, we have a setup with a camera that is observing uh, where I'm looking at with my eyes. So uh, it even differentiates whether I'm looking at your screen or into the rear view mirror, which I obviously should do. Mm. Um, but there will, you know, at some point also be some entertainment maybe in that screen when there's full self-driving. Sure. Uh, we know that the EQS is already able to drive on the motorway up to 60 kilometers an hour, um, you know, in this level three driving mode. Will this also be possible with the EQE? No, sorry, this, this is a feature we will not have in the EQE, this, this capability for uh, highly automated driving. Uh, this is something we have positioned in the luxury segment as, as our entry for this uh, feature. So this for now is not available in the EQE. I was curious, uh, you started basically like with this more CLS comparison. Why would you rather see this closer to the CLS than to the E-Class? It has a couple of features that um, we already introduced to the market with the CLS. For example, the doors. We have the doors without the uh, frame for the windows, for example. Uh, that's this kind of four-door coupe attribute that also the EQE has. And um, also the the slope of the roof and a lot of, let's say, visual attributes that make it more comparable to, an, to a CLS rather than an E-Class as a, as a um, let's say, the, the sedan, the classic sedan. Oh, okay. So um, we have a um, normal steel spring as base here. Yes. And an optional air suspension. This vehicle here is equipped with an air suspension. Yes. So um, all these, let's say, hard facts technology-wise, like suspension um, also, the, the main chassis maybe, also the battery, is that all somewhat similar to the EQS? Mm -hmm. The, the drivetrain is very comparable because it's made out of this family approach. So the battery is that we use in this car is the same one that we have in the EQS, in the 350. Uh, the electric motors, the, the ETUs, they are the same. Uh, so all the, the driveline configuration is very comparable between the two cars. 
the 91 EQ kilowatt hours for that uh, yes. small yes. battery here and uh, this is the eqs uh, sorry no sorry EQE. <laughs> the eqe 350, 350 that means rear wheel drive Yes, rear wheel drive, yeah. uh, 250 kilowatts. And you can, when the traffic light jumps to green, you can uh, maybe show us the sure. acceleration. <laughs> I think it's supposed to be like something six seconds yes. to 100 kilometers yeah. or 62 yeah. miles an hour. We can only do zero to 50 here, obviously. But yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, when it would be zero to 50 miles, then it would yes. be more fun, right? But this 250 kilometers. But I mean, like this first sprint, like the first 50 kilometers, is like the most Yes, most interesting, one, as, anyway. as all electric cars, <laughs> The big benefit of the electric motor is having full torque from starting with the zero RPM. So, and that's always impressive. This one will also be available with all wheel drive, with yes. the, uh, probably also like EQE 450 or something. Mm -hmm. um, will this one here with a rear wheel drive only be more efficient? Yes, that's why we, we call it the 350 plus. Um, we kind of attributed the plus um, to the vehicle in the lineup that has the highest range and um, ah, okay. I thought plus uh, stands for the all-wheel drive, maybe. No, but no, no. That, that's like a, <laughs> like a star or something. Like, exactly. hey, that's the range king. Exactly. Interesting. Oh, okay, because I recently was driving the EQS 450 plus. Oh, we leave some room. Yeah. Uh, we go. Well, that's it already. Oh, uh, yeah. So you were asking about um, yeah. the body structure of the vehicles and whether they are comparable. Yeah. From a design standpoint, the layout, the architecture are very comparable. Mm -hmm. In terms of the, the material mix we are employing in those two cars, they, are, they, dif they differentiate, or we differentiate them because the EQS is built, we just passed here, Factory 56. It's built uh, together with the S-Class, the conventional mm -hmm. S-Class, and we have a higher share of aluminum in that body structure. So, oh, okay. Um, that's that's a little different mix. The EQE is built in Bremen and in future also in China. And those are built uh, together with the C-Class, which has a higher share of, of steel in the body structure. So uh, in order to fit in those production setups, we had to kind of integrate more steel into the structure of the EQE. So in, in terms of weight, they are closer to each other than you would think by size. And is uh, the steel like more steel chassis here, you know, does it have more flex? Is it less stiff? No, no, no. In terms of the, let's say, dynamic behavior of the cars, mm. um, we design them to whatever material mix we employ. They all have to fulfill the same okay. functionality, whether it's le like, say, the, the, the torsional stiffness or uh, safety purposes and all that. So that's, that's independent of the material mix. You just have to choose a different approach to do it. So the um, wheelbase here is around nine centimeters or like three, three and a half inches shorter than in the EQS. Yes. And double than that is, you know, the length difference, yes. like 20 centimeters, yes. um, and, like and that's eight the, inches, nine inches difference in, in the length. That's um, the visual appearance you also yeah, have. We have yeah. shorter overhangs on this car than on the uh, EQS that makes it look a little more uh, compact. Oh. And I, I, I would say, I really feel that, you know, I've just been driving the EQS actually, um, you know, I um, just drove it yesterday and it is a notable feeling. Mm -hmm. So uh, this one indeed, when you just compare the length, right, it more feels like an like an E-Class or CLS in length. And you also feel that, that shorter wheelbase, you know, when you mm -hmm. like maybe do some right and yeah. left turning. Then we, the, can, we can do some turns later yeah. on. and. Obviously, the, the rear steering, we also have the rear steering of four and a half degrees or 10 degrees uh, in this car, um, together with a shorter wheelbase, shorter overhangs, the, the turning yeah. radius on this car is really phenomenal. And, and we can see that later. And um, with a, as you said, you drove the EQS, the electric vehicles in, in general, due to the battery, low center of gravity, long wheelbases, um, they are almost stoic in, in going mm. continuously straight. But um, the, the challenge is to also make them agile and make them turn nice and, and be maneuverable. And that's what we achieve with the rear axle steering. Uh, we had the 21 inch wheels here on this yes. one here as well. And um, so I have the same set, I mean the EQS at the moment, 21 inch and air suspension. This one also equipped with the optional air suspension. And comfort wise, um, I mean, did you have like a little stiffer setup here with the EQE or is it more or less the same setup than with the EQS? The, the setup is very comparable. As I said, mm. the, the weight doesn't differ too much. Yeah. Um, the wheel diameters are not too far apart from each other. 
So the setup is, I would say, really comparable. And yeah, you can, I would, especially I would also with, the, say so, yeah. with the spring setup, you you can you can adjust it to your taste. I mean, with um, with the 21 inch wheels, of course, when we go over some potholes or something, you do feel it. If you want more yes. comfort, stay with smaller wheels. We have 19 inch wheels as as an entry position. So once you start with those, you have a little more air and rubber. No, but overall, I would say it's very good driving comfort and also noise insulation wise, I feel it's really silent. Yes. So I wouldn't say like, oh, this is only the EQE and then it's louder than the EQS. So, I mean, there is this raw chassis foam applied to the EQS, but they do the S-Class. That's probably a planned thing. We, we do have that here as well. We, do, do, do they yes. do that in Bremen yes. as well? Oh, interesting. Yes. And again, due to the different body structure, it's, it's a different application. Um, but that's also we, something we employ here. Yeah, but I mean, that, that, that's really good. So they don't have like so much compromise. And yeah, of course, this yeah. will here start at a way lower price than the EQS, like the E-Class exactly. to the, to the yeah. S-Class, you yeah. know, that makes it, uh, you know. Uh, I, I was a little bit disappointed that it didn't have like the, um, the fastback opening, that there was like this closed trunk, so to speak, mm -hmm. because that would have been also, you know, that you also like with the EQS have some kind of a, mixed estate practicability yes. yeah. or something but was it something that you say yeah that was needed that we have more headroom in the rear exactly that okay. was the reasoning behind that and okay. same as with the cls um, if, if you want to go for let's say a highly aerodynamic and also coupe like uh, silhouette of the car uh, you have to slope the roof down somewhat mm. and if you still want to have uh, ample headroom in in the rear seats you somehow have to protect that area where you would then have the hinges for your larger rear door. So that's why we chose here to go for a conventional setup um, and therefore have maximized the headroom and also for the accessibility of the, the trunk, it's, it's beneficial to do it conventionally. About the recuperation, so there's a maximum recuperation, I think 260 kilowatts? Yes. Maximum, so you can basically charge your car faster by braking than at the charging station. Sure. <laughs> But um, that's that's all pretty yeah. pretty much uh, an intense yeah. braking. Yeah? When that's, you go down it all the time, that's not something you sustain for yeah. a very long. Start period at of Pike's time. Peak and then go down it all the time, for example. <laughs> for example, across the Brenner. Uh, at the moment, you're at normal recuperation. It means when you lift your foot off the throttle, it's we are, we're more or less it's almost sailing. Huh? And that's then you can there. adjust the shifting yeah. pedals. No now recuperation. This, now we are right no recuperation. Press. And left one, you can go to the yes. strong. Yeah. I'm not doing anything else. Just and it's more or less one pedal driving. But the thing is, I realized also in the EQS, it's not a one pedal driving in a way of that the car comes to a standstill, right? Yes. It doesn't do it. Well, the, it, it's the almost standstill. We will probably run at a red light soon yeah. where we can, we can uh, demonstrate that feature there. But I yeah. mean, what, what, what was the reasoning behind that? Because when people are used to one pedal driving, they normally have the experience that the car mm -hmm. also comes to a standstill. Yeah. Well, the question is, do, do you want to give the impression that the car is while in driving mode um, and at rest, that it would be safe to, for example, leave the car, for example. So mm. you would always would have or would want the, the driver to be on the brakes or to disengage the driving mode. So for, for example, we have the, the, the feature that uh, the hill hold features and all that. Um, that would be something that would be somewhat in, in, the, in the logical conflict to that. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, I yeah see frankly, it's breaking yeah, pretty hard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's strong, but, but it, it, won't, it won't come. Oh. Yeah, we were rolling uh, now. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's go the thing. So I, I, would, I would say that to you make a real, that? yeah, real one, but there's one exception when you go to this uh, intelligent mm -hmm. recuperation mode. Um, so it's like press and holding one of the pedals. Then when you have like a, when you're stuck in, in traffic or something, then the car does come to a still sim because it sees, hey, there's a like a... The one ahead of us is yeah, stopping yeah, yeah, as well, yeah. yeah. So... And it would commence again at, as well. Yeah, so that's maybe uh, something. Um, so I really like this intelligent recuperation mode because it, it rolls when there's no one in front of mm -hmm. you and it stops or it has harder recuperation when there is some, mm -hmm. someone in front of you. Uh, but the thing is, what, what I experience also, it's always being resetted, you know? Can't you make it um, adjustable and say like, hey, I'm a customer who wants to have the intelligent recuperation all the time, or I want to have strong recuperation all the time, yeah. that I shut down the car, 
start up again and it's in the very same mode. Well, we, as the cars have so many setups today, the, the question whether you stay in last mode, that's kind of the technical term we use for, for that discussion, or whether you always go to the pre-setting. And, and that's a difficult situation or a difficult question because you have the potential that many different people use a car. And mm. uh, not everyone might be accustomed to these very specific setups that you chose. And also there are some, some implications in, in terms of uh, rulings that you um, kind of, for example, when it comes to the driving mode, you have to have the mode that gives you the best benefit in terms of range, for example. You can't mm. uh, select a different mode that's, uh, let's say, uh, yeah, worse in, in the performance with that respect and leave it in that mode forever, huh? for example. So, yeah, I mean, from a rental car perspective, that makes sense. But from a like owner, customer, single user mm -hmm. experience, I mean, would be better to have the same. I mean, but you could. But we can do like an option, that, right? But you could have like an option in the infotainment system mm -hmm. and say like, uh, save last driving mode or something. Yeah. That maybe that the standard would be like this, and then when you activate last driving mode feature, mm -hmm. then then you could activate it, you know. But then again, who who makes you? Uh, eligible to activate that because I, I bought the freaking car right? it's mine <laughs> we can probably it's do it like, like a video ID thing and then we could preset it maybe. yeah so guys <laughs> if you share my view that you should be able to activate that last driving mode setting put it in the comments then Jörg will read these comments and then get back. we will consider yeah yeah that's the thing I mean that this happened um, uh, you know a lot of times when we had some prototype drives um, and also because we have so many existing customers of, for example, predecessor generations, in this case, of course not, but of course, always great to read the real customer comments. And then, you know, the, these guys can also take a lot, of, a lot of experience from that, actually. So what would you say, um, I mean, you're ahead of this project. The one thing that you say that absolutely stands out with this vehicle, if you have to put one thing. Um, if it's only one thing, it's the efficiency. Um, I really love how efficient we use the, the energy we have on board with the battery, and that you really get uh, long ranges in everyday driving, whether it's cold or warm, and whether you are going faster or slower. Um, range is, is always really on, on a very high level and very close to the certification values, which is important for us. So we don't have too much of a gap between what is a certification value and what the, the average user will um, have, can, what he can expect while driving. So that's, that's probably the, the biggest pro. And if the second biggest one for me is the rear axle steering, I absolutely love it. Yeah, rear axle steering, especially when you drive slower, it makes the car so much more agile. It kind of yes. takes a short wheelbase. It feels kind of unreal almost. Uh, what's the threshold when it changes from, um, you know, going in the opposite direction in the front wheels to parallel direction, what's the uh, uh, speed threshold? Honestly, I, I don't want to put out a wrong number now. I would have to look it up. Yeah, but I think it also, um, yeah, it sometimes de depends also on, on the on the, on the setting yeah. version yeah. and so on. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I have to go I slow here. I have a radar it's trap. A, yeah. The car should tell us that, right? We, we but it's not, 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 it's not allowed in Germany to, <laughs> to have these information. Nope. But, uh, but you're allowed to know where it is if you drive yeah. by <laughs> twice a day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's really nice acceleration, but smooth at the, at the same time. Yeah. Um, I do prefer the rear-wheel drive versions, by the way, because mm -hmm. when you get out of the corner, you just, you know, come around with the rear. Yeah, it's pretty it's cool It's just here. beautiful. Yeah. And uh, we can test the different uh, sound experiences, by yes. the way. Uh, so settings, then we have here vehicle, sound experience on, there we go. So, and then, uh, yeah, we, we start by roaring pulse, it's more like a low frequency sound, where you can see about that. You heard that? Like more like, then we can try vivid flux. It's more like, you know, Star Trek engage, like <laughs> And then we have silver waves, which have more high frequency. Mm. 
fairly notable here. Yeah. But I think um, Silverwax is a little bit more audible when you're at slower speeds. At I slower think, speeds yeah. and also in yeah. uh, uh, recuperation. Yeah. But for example, here I think it's good that you can use it mm -hmm. and you have a choice. Exactly. But you can also deactivate it when you say like, ah, that's just, I want to show off to my friends once, but then that's it, you know, and then I want to have a deactivate or something. So um, this is actually a good choice. You can, you, you, I, I, you're I, not like, you're not end up with a setting you don't want, you know. And I so. think that's really important because, um, for example, many people are somewhat annoyed by noises and yeah. um, the, the big benefit of an electric car is the, the quietness yeah. and how, how smooth everything is. So um, to give the option to just keep it that way and leave it like that um, is, uh, we think it's important. Yeah, or the, the ambient lighting, you know, we have this you know, energy shine setting where uh, now it's a little bit bright outside because but you see here it, it changes then depending on um, if you are pressing the, the go pedal, we sometimes call it now. We had the discussion, uh, do we still call it accelerator or throttle? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, is that, because it's not a throttle like technically, you know, so we, some, we just name it pedal or go pedal or mm -hmm. yeah accelerator pedal would also work right yeah. or how do you call it internally or do you say internally you stay like we, you we know we are germans we are engine builders we call it throttle that's it we still call it the, the accelerator pedal because okay. that's mm -hmm. kind of the function it employs um, that, that that's what it technically is yeah yeah there is no throttle cable linkage anymore I mean, you you, uh, you are using uh, so many marketing words for so many different functions, and then formatic plus plus whatever. You could also say like, a, oh, this is our EQ power pedal or something, right? Maybe this is to come very soon. Or Maybe we can put it in the comments if someone yeah. has a good idea how to uh, name yeah. the thing. When in the future every manufacturer will call their pedal in a different way, then um, yeah. Um, yeah, also with the ambient lighting, of course, you do not, do not have to use that. This, um, you know, I always call it circus mode. <laughs> um, it's interesting and also good for showing off to your friends, but probably when you drive every day, then the mono color will maybe do, um, yeah, you know, just a little bit less distraction for, for that. Well, what's your, do you, do you like that one or do you rather well, want to? I, I rather have it um, kind of bluer color. tones and yeah. single tone. Um, I have. Uh, three daughters, they, they uh, like it more like colorful, them. let's put it that way. <laughs> well, here's a nice roundabout where we can experience the rear axle steering and it just feels amazing and we yeah. could do much tighter turns even. Well, um, if you have the 10 degrees rear axle steering, uh, do you know by heart how much it reduces yeah. the turning circle? Almost two meters. Two we, meters reduction. So it's um, from, from 12.7 meters without rear axle steering um, it reduces down to 10 point, I think 7, 10 point 7. So wow. it's almost two meters uh, reduction in turning circle, which is a lot if you're maneuvering. And um, since EQS also has the rear axle steering, do they differ much then? Or is it like, has the EQE even more and more narrow turning circle? Is it much different? It's, it's uh, still li little smaller because yeah. uh, still the, the length, uh, or the overhangs and the uh, wheelbase, they both contribute yeah. and therefore it's, it's still a little larger on the EQS. Yeah. So what I feel from my passenger experience so far is all the features that make the EQS special, like, you know, good noise uh, insulation and this, you know, spontaneous ride, um, also the, the air suspension and so on, you all get that. But I feel that with the shorter wheelbase, the car feels sportier, it feels more agile. I can already feel that it's more driving fun. Yes, you know, it, it feels, it feels like, I mean, the weight difference is not really present, right? You say like weight difference is not the thing, but it's still, feels lighter because of that shorter wheelbase then of course the rear axle steering um, as well so if driving fun is a thing for you then the EQE, EQE will help and also of course is less, less expensive the seats of course you know when you have this optional very plush setting in the EQS they are softer in a way but I feel that they do not offer so much more comfort because I feel that you are almost getting blown out of the seat you know because it's so uber plush <laughs> um, so I feel I like to be a little bit more connected to the seat you know in a way um, oh next video uh, is the EQS now in the autoplay um, yeah that's of course recommended so when you guys drive in the EQE in the future then you have Autogo Fuel Channel running all the time that's of course good um, 
Yeah, this is, this is a good way to compare then, you know, so we can watch the EQS video while driving the EQE and then have a comparison of that. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess um, if money doesn't play a role and you could uh, buy a vehicle for yourself, would you pick the EQS or the EQE? Well, for, for me, as I like the more compact behavior, um, I think it would be the EQE. Uh, I also like the, the, conventional, um, the, the conventional trunk. Um, in terms of driver comfort, nothing beats uh, the, the S-Class ambience in, that you have in, in the EQS. Um, but again, also with conventional cars, I would consider myself more an E-Class guy than an S-Class guy. Yeah, and um, yeah, I mean, especially we car enthusiasts yeah. who really like to drive ourselves. Yeah, acceleration out of the corner, this is really interesting. Maybe yeah. in sport mode, maybe. Okay, we can go in sport mode, but yeah. then you have even more boost. Yeah. Is it? There we go. Then yeah, sports. sport mode. Uh, the, do, we, do we have more power now? No. Uh, see? Oh. Woo! Nice. Yeah, a little bit, you know, yeah. moving rear, it's very cool, sport mode. It doesn't the prohibit ESC. having fun. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, is the, when you an accelerate in combat mode or accelerate in sport mode, do we have more power? We, we have a different, um, let's say, torque to uh, RPM um, graph that we follow when ramping up the E-motor. So there's a little difference there, but the, the max power is the same. Oh, okay. So, um, so, but we want to give a different feel. So yeah. we, we change the, the way how we get from minimum power to maximum power. So here, basically, the maximum power is reached earlier than in sport mode. Well, in, in, in terms, especially if you start the acceleration, you get more torque and um, a, a quicker ramp up, therefore. So, ah, OK. Yeah. Because that's all software any big, anyway, yeah. because the electric motor it could deliver 100% torque all time, right? All times, right. But you have to kind of somewhat adjust that to what your uh, accelerator pedal is yeah. kind of giving. Yeah. So maybe we'll turn around here and demonstrate our minimum turning circle here. So we'll just turn right here. How about like that? Well, that is Isn't that impressive? That's like with a VW Polo or something. Yeah, with like a go-kart. Yeah, I mean, the, the turn exit is one of a compact, compact or even small car. A 10.7 meters is really short. Yeah. That's really small. Yeah, I think a VW Up or something has 10 meters. And then 11 is, I think, a Polo or yeah. something like this. Yeah, it should be something like this. Yeah, it's really impressive indeed. And especially if you're maneuvering in the city and, um, let's say, have tight corners to cut, that's, it's really great. Feels good. Yeah. And it's the first time you're really surprised because you wouldn't expect uh, it to be enough room to turn, actually. You talked about the efficiency. Um, so we have this smaller battery here now, mm -hmm. unlike the top battery in the EQS. So we are 108 kilowatt hours versus 91 kilowatt hours net. The smaller one is also available in the EQS. This kind of loss in kilowatt hours, you know, does it make a huge different difference range-wise? Well, in in fact, um, the let's say let's start with the, the efficiency contributor. So, with a car, when you're moving fast, it's certainly the aerodynamics. The EQS is uh, really the best car we have um, with a um, drag coefficient of 0 0.2. Um, we have all the features that made that really champion value also incorporated in this car, but because it's a little shorter, physics, you can't betray them, it's going to be a little less good than in the EQS, um, but also a great value. Which that, is so that's a very interesting fact, you know, because you might think, oh, the smaller the car, the more efficient, but when it's about wind efficiency, Length longer is, is good, better. Longer is better, um, but the, the cross section is also important, and that's again where the cars are very similar, so um, you are losing a little bit on the length, um, although the, the drag coefficient itself is, is very comparable. Huh? So that's, that's one thing. The electric motors, the electric system, as we already said, is, is exactly the same. So, the, and the weight, again, also comparable. So this, um, let's say, reduced energy content that we have in the battery also almost 
linearly uh, translates into less range. So that's that's almost a linear ratio. We have 780 with the EQS in the WLTP, and this one's going to top out around 650. Okay, these are the official figures. Yes. Um, I mean, we can talk about our test with the EQS with the bigger battery. And in summertime, we ended up some 600 plus kilometers or 400 something miles. That was possible in very good conditions. But we have a catch here with the EQS and the EQE. It does not have a heat pump. That's true. And I really wonder about that because I did a winter test now on the EQS and the range was almost cut in half. And I did not really, I mean, it was driving rather slowly and I had hit more like 220 miles or 350 kilometers, so um, consumption of about 33 kilowatt hours on 100 kilometers. Um, so what are you going to do about this? Well, I, I have a little different experience, especially with the EQS. I drove uh, shortly before Christmas and um, I drove more than 500 kilometers and I had my, my daughters were trying and employing every mode that the car had and seat <laughs> heaters everywhere. and. So I, I would say we used quite some energy, not for driving, um, but again, um, the, the range was, I it wasn't was around e I wasn't three, even to watching five, three to five uh, degrees. Uh, so maybe a little warmer than what you like, used or experienced. And uh, I was not disappointed. And we had um, a consumption on one way of 22 kilowatt hours per 100 kilometers. And I was floating in traffic, let's say 120 mm. on highways, autobahns. And on the way back, I uh, drove faster, more 160. And then the uh, consumption went up to 26, or roughly 20, 26 kilowatt hours. So you're not using the heat, uh, heat pump because you say we don't need it? At the moment, we don't need it. Yeah. And we are looking into options in, to improve, of course, mm. because as, as I said, uh, efficiency is king, um, especially for electric vehicles. So we are not going to stop development, that's, that's for sure. I'll I mean, from my experience, I would strongly recommend a heat pump. Could you implement this like space-wide? Is there some spot left in the car where you could say like, yeah, we might be able to do that? Everything's possible. Everything's possible, he says. <laughs> okay, so EQE or EQS facelift. I'm pretty sure there will be a heat pump. I'm pretty sure about this. <laughs> Not only. <laughs> we, are, we are working on cars and I think with the EQXX, um, that was a good indicator in, in mm. where the technology is going and what the direction is going to be. And uh, when, when it comes to the drivetrain efficiency, that's, that's it. Is there anything I can do right now to increase winter range? I've read one, um, one of our um, you know, um, viewers, EQS customer, he says he puts it in the um, AC setting Eco Plus mm -hmm. and then he could save like massive amounts of range in winter time with the cost of being a little bit cold for the first 15 minutes. And that, you know? That's a big contribution. And um, especially if you are driving in conditions where you are not using a lot of power for driving, um, the more, the higher the share of the energy you use for heating. Mm. So let's, let's see that, like this, this eco setting here. That's so actually a big difference. Eco, eco, yeah. Like, well, what's the exact difference between Comfort Eco and Eco Plus? Is it more just like well, it, cold it reduces, and colder? <laughs> it reduces temperature, lower speeds, hmm. so um, maybe it cuts down earlier. Um, let's say differentiates in, in the distribution of the air. Um, hmm. So multiple measures because um, heating, as with your house uh, in winter, heating is the main driver for energy consumption. I mean, I rather said, okay, it's a very interesting approach, but when I buy the electric S-Class and including options for 180,000 euros, I don't want to wear my jacket in the car for the first 20, 15 minutes. That's yes. what I was thinking, that, that's although efficiency is always good. <laughs> um, but I mean, that's our opinion as well. And that's yeah. why we don't enforce, this, enforce mm. that on, on the customers and drivers. But uh, it's a choice. You, you can choose to, to lower uh, let's say the thermal comfort, um, if you want to increase range, you can choose to do that. So when I set it here to Eco Plus now, how much longer would it take for the car to warm up actually? Well, there are, there are many factors that go in there, but... Um, Just like it, approximately? Um, I'll say 10 minutes maybe. 10 minutes. Yeah. 
It's it's really guess. I don't, I don't have a number in terms of under which testing conditions we yeah. have how many minutes yeah. less. But we have we, we measure the, the temperature for your feet and for your headroom mm -hmm. because that's that's different uh, as well. And how mm -hmm. do you distribute between front and rear? So there are many factors um, that contribute to that. So maybe you discuss it then with your wife, saying like, "Sorry, honey, you have to be cold for 10 minutes, and then it will get cozy because." Range, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's say if we are running short to reach the the next charging point, then I would maybe discuss it. Uh, otherwise, I'd rather charge. <laughs> I'd charge because <laughs> we can charge so fast now. Uh, you have 170 kilowatts charging power. Um, that worked that's, very well in the EQS. It works had, well. We really had well. like uh, in about 30 minutes, we charged over 80 kilowatt hours. Yes. That's, uh, I haven't seen that yet, actually. Because it's, it's, a, it's the same it's here, right? It sustains the high yeah. Uh, yeah. charging current, and, and that's, that's key to get a lot of energy into the car in a short period of time. Is it the same here with a smaller battery? It's a little less, little, yeah. because the, the energy needs to be distributed um, over the different cells of the battery. But the, like the, the max peak is less. It's, so it's 100, it is 170 kilowatts, the peak. Okay, yeah. but I mean... But then it will then probably more go more than uh, towards 150 or something yeah. like that. Yeah. So uh, it won't make the biggest difference in charging then, probably, no. because... I mean, we were also, we were starting at, I think, 188. And then it dropped down to slowly 170, 160. Something like that, you will that, see here. Yeah. But yeah. with an offset of, I don't know, 10, 10 or 20 kilowatts. Yeah, yeah. So, but in reality, that's still a lot of energy in a short period of time. Yeah. And if you, if you plug in your car and you mm. just walk off to get a coffee and you're coming back, you're probably most likely already done. Last comment here to the um, uh, seating comfort. Actually, these are, it's, it's an AMG line. We, we see also here the red console stitches. So these here are the sportier seats we're on here right now, right? Uh, to look at headrest, yes. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, like the base seat will be, you know, with a separate head restraint then, yes. and a little bit uh, softer as for the cushion as well. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So um, this one, yeah, I mean, it's already quite soft, but if you want it a little bit softer, then then you would rather not go for the AMG line and stay with a base, you know, softer seat. Learned a lot about the EQE in driving now. We also have already the complete episode where we have it in the studio with all the exterior and interior details. And of course, if you want to compare the Mercedes EQS, a lot of the comparisons we've been talking about, if you want to see where that came from, check out this episode. And thank you so much for the ride. Thank you.